Hello everyone, this is Fantastic Worlds, so I get back to Lovecraft Country and the Secret World Interludes, and we are currently be doing the northern section of the Shadowy Forest. In other words, the edge of the Shadowy Forest. Now, what happens is the difference between this and the Besieged Farmlands is the Besieged Farmlands are the domain of men in which fairy touch, but this is the domain of fairy in which some men touch. Now, of course, it's the Halloween season why I'm doing this, so I have my Matrix Ghost costume on. I don't expect any of you remember the second Matrix film and those um, dreadlocked uh, ghosts, but I just realized I could make that costume with the stuff I had on me, and I just kind of had to do it. Also, I brought the ghost dog. Uh, so, basically, I am an electronic ghost. In any case, the first thing you're going to notice when you come out of this border point here is this checkpoint. Now, the checkpoint's a little weird here, because you notice that there's a bunch of werewolves over there, and there's just, like, this scout camp here. So, the question, I mean, you've got military convoy vessels here, uh, but no weapons, no experienced soldiers. The only person who has a uniform and a gun... Oh, wait, they don't even have a gun. Seriously. Why aren't these people dead? And I have my theory about that. Now, we know about Mihas. He's been in a couple of missions, basically the one uh, where we first came to that section, and he's also in the bonus episode that was unlocked last time, the Trials of the Draculesti. Now, let me see if I can get a better angle on him. All right, so the question is, who the hell is he? Because recall, this is a man who can fight a warrior of Gaia nearly to unconsciousness in straight up fist fight. That shouldn't be possible since that I regenerate and I also have um, supernatural strength. So who is this individual? Why does he have the ability to be so strong? He and his brothers can be to slay monsters barehanded. So let's let him talk about himself. I am a good fighter, a strong fighter. But a fighter does not only seek the victory. He is always preparing, always searching for the one who will best him. That is where the truest experience is waiting, where he can breathe it in. Now, what he means by that is that a warrior's code, an old-fashioned one, is always looking for the person who can best them so that that person can teach them. They're not looking to get killed, for example. So what happens is that he is constantly looking for the person who could do so. He basically must have come, they had three and his brothers must have come to the apex of whatever organization they belong to. Now, it's not, however, the Romani. Before the Dracolesh took See? in me and my brothers, we fought their greatest warriors. Oh, yes, it was a long night of cheering and bruises. Red faces and raw knuckles. And drinking. I kept those bruises like trophies. Hmm. I beat down everyone. But uh, they were slowed by the drink and the dancing. <laughs> Not a fair fight. Uh-huh. Basically, he's underselling his strength. But we already know that he has supernatural strength. Morning came. And then into the afternoon. They promised us a rematch one day. If we would join with the Dracolesh. That's what they promised. But there were always excuses, new monsters to hunt. Mm -hmm. Next season we fight, Mihas. In the quiet season we fight, Mihas. I shall be ready for it. Uh-huh. Yeah, and you may notice that despite fighting with him, despite willing to risk his life for them, they're not giving him full membership as if they distrust him for some reason and his brothers. Milos tells us much about Vlad Dracula. A great man. A strong man. An honorable man. A ruler of men. I would very much like to have fought him. Instead, I fight at his side. He is with us at every step. That's a strange amount of fascination for a figure that supposedly doesn't even fit into his backstory. Why would that be, do you think? Vlad Dracula gave no compromise, none to his enemies, to monsters. We must never forget what they are. That was his lesson to the Draculesh. Mm -hmm. The monsters had their time of great cities like rats' nests, the stories say. That's not actually something I've heard about yet. Basically, they're probably referring to some earlier age in which, remember, Lilith, we don't know when Lilith created both the werewolves and the vampires, which is probably what it's referring to, but she might have had a empire of them at once. An animal knows when its time is over. Men, too. 
They still fight for it. It is always a battle. But they see their fate. The strong will survive. Mm -hmm. The monster has nothing in those eyes. I have looked into them many times, right before my face, seen the dull light go out beneath my knuckles. The monster never accepts fate. Vlad Dracula taught the Draculesh once to give no quarter, and we never will. Okay, so yes, the thing is, he's make sure that you under you caught that that he tells us the difference between men, between animals, and between monsters. Three different categories rather than two. Again, I think it supports my theory on him. It is my choice to be out here in the wild and not in the camp. I meditate in the good dirt. I box with shadows in the smell of rain. I leap from branch to branch mm -hmm. as I scale the tallest trees. That doesn't sound very human, now does it? Leaping tree to tree, scaling them, living in the good dirt. Does that sound like something else? My brothers and I. We made these woods our playground. But still, they are different. The dew clings to the trees, cold like it is the sweat of sickness. The mist leaves a taste in the mouth, a taste of metal. I know that taste well. Now note, the taste of metal can refer to many things, but sometimes blood is said to have a metallic taste. Don't actually experience that myself, though. It's a steel trap in this forest, closing around us, not all at once, but slowly. I do not fear it. To die in the resting place of Vlad Dracula, that is an honor! I will say to his knightly spirit that I followed him through the darkness gladly. Mm-hmm. A lot of fascination for someone who's not in your bloodline, eh? And I will tell him of all the creatures I sent before me down into the center of the world. Hmm. Into the underworld. Milosh is expecting you. Don't let your eyes wander when you speak with Emilia. Milosh will cut them out and serve them to you. Just scroll them back. Yeah, I have my opinion about uh, Mi Mihas Blag and the Blaga brothers. Um, the thing is, take a look around you. Until next time. Yes, until next time. You've got this werewolf camp. You've got another werewolf camp down here. And yet, you have this group sitting here peacefully. Well, they've got one sniper. But honestly, I don't think they could handle all of that. Um... Yeah, you, you'll notice they're hiding there every now and then. It's part of a mission, but it's kind of also brilliant that you have these little places where they're actually holding guard, where you're realizing that they're not just a bunch of stereotypes hanging around in a camp, dancing, and then singing. They're actually warriors. Partisans, actually. Ooh, look, I got somebody over there. Anyways, but you notice that this camp over here has got... A bunch of kids, plus Mihas and supposedly his brothers, and yet, do you see any shelters besides that one over there for the uh, council member? Do you see a lot of supplies? Just a few there, medical supplies over there. It's almost as if they don't need them. It's almost as if they weren't human. Because, if you recall back a little while, when we spoke to the vampire in the church, he said that the vampire bloodline was different than the vampires we've been fighting. It was a disease, because remember, Lilith made that as a contagious disease. You can get infected by it, um, according to the mission that he gives you. But the thing is, is that the, like with the vampire uh, virus. It's quite possible the werewolf virus also had its rarefied lines, ones that were more men than beasts, because he referred to animals knowing their time before men do. And he's probably hunted quite a few animals in one form or another. Now, remember, he fought us, a warrior of Gaia. I wasn't using any of my powers at the time, and you'll see that or have seen that episode, depending on where, you're, where you are in real time with this, and he nearly defeated me. Now, that would be almost impossible for any human, no matter how strong it is. But if a person was infected with a werewolf virus and 
was capable of controlling it to the point where they could channel the supernatural uh, strength without losing their humanity, which his brother does during the mission. Spoiler there. Um, the uh, then, And also, these five here have probably also been infected because that's why they don't need weapons. That's why they don't even need guards. All of them have enhanced senses. But it's also why they're not in the main camp because they're not trusted. Remember, they Mihas joined the Romani. He's not a member of them, and he knows a lot about Dracula, and the two people who would know it would be the people who fought by Dracula's side and the ones who fight against him. Because when you come right down to it, the vampires of the Purified Line and the werewolves of the Purified Line probably respect their enemies, you know? They probably see them as their equals, and the champions judge a man by his enemies, and they are, in probably the vampire's mind, a good enemy to have. They are the best enemy. They've been fighting for centuries and neither side really getting, and despite not having the supernatural bonuses, they, they've been doing quite well. So Mihas, believing that the only challenge left is to join his people's enemies in this last crusade, because he's not going to join Lilith's side and the degenerates, has joined forces with the Romani. And the Romani have accepted him as a warrior, but not as a person. And there's a severe difference to that. In any case, this direction back here, we'll go first. Now, this one's one of the few actual... This one's not an actual road. Now, remember, most of the roads we go down are created by the Soviets during their occupation. But this one is an older one, and it belongs to that house. But first, the Oriachi. Yeah, you're going to find these spots here and there where the Oriachi field teams have been utterly slaughtered. Excuse me. All right, guys. Now, I've been utterly slaughtered by their equipment. That This is part of their, their um, snatch teams. You, see, you can see the remains up here. And that they've been trying to get uh, both... Oh, I'll deal with that later. They've been trying to get both um, samples of supernatural creatures to experiment on. And as we know, during the uh, first time we meet Lilith, they're snatching kids, too. All right. But here is one of the older resins. Now, the thing about the people who live on this edge of the woods are the ones either that have learned to live with the Fae the, um, in some fashion because the Romani have a contract with the Fae. They stay out of certain portions. The Fae don't hunt them. That seems reasonable. We've got a couple. We've got the, the doctor who in the, probably set up, set up the wards to protect him or her. Actually, it's the 13th doctor at this point. And of course, we've got... Uh, these guys. These guys who live off the fairies. Now, here's the thing. They have a whole bunch of trained wolves, or I would say corrupted wolves. And the thing is, you're not going to find uh, him having any dialogue options here because he doesn't like you and he's not going to talk to you. But as you can see, these lovely do. Oh, God, I wish I could set you on fire. But yeah, these lovely gentlemen, and sorry, the father-mother team, probably lovers too, considering that, have been butchering the supernatural creatures for meat. Now, there's the problem that, first of all, these creatures have infectious diseases, so if you don't cook the meat, probably, you're going to get infected. Remember, there's actually, you probably don't know this if you're not playing the game, but there's actually an agent network where you do these off-screen missions to gain small amounts of resources. Uh, it's a little you know, spin your wheel sort of thing, but it does help grind. The thing about that is that one of them is about tracing back how an infected group of hot dogs managed to turn to turning people into werewolves. Where do you think that came from? This lovely, but this lovely dude here and his mother, who you can't, the Demirs, you can't actually find his mother when he, except for the introductions. Uh, hang on, guys. Okay. But as you can see, this is their home. Rustic, huh? The heck? A oh, bunch of wolves in alert to my presence. Doesn't really matter. But notice they've got the garlic on the windows here. Although not the main door, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, so yeah, these guys have been living with the fae and the vampires and the werewolves and managing to survive, which means that they are not stupid. And I... She's probably in there anyways. I suspect, again, they're not human. That would explain why the boy is so messed up and why she's got this cunning to her. The thing is, we know their husband, you know the father's dead. 
Oops, sorry, hit the microphone. We know the father's dead because in one of the missions, you will see the note right here, which indicates that she's writing him and then realizing that he's dead. But we don't know if he was human or not, which is actually what I suspect. I suspect, again, that she married a non-human, which is why her child is so wrong. Now, my guess is it's not one of the, you know, lighter version of the Fae that she's got. And it was a carnivorous creature of some sort how she managed to quote unquote seduce it assuming that she just didn't take what she needed from it or that their relationship i don't want to know anything about that okay but you notice the compound is rather large to be run by two people my guess is there had to have been a larger group here and especially there's no way that all of this is being hunted by one person. So there's more going on in the surface here. This facility underneath the ground where they hold all of their prisoners as well, it's huge. So unless that kid over there is like capable of operating 24 seven and highly motivated, there is something a little off about all of this. Oh, I'm always glad when I can set these things on fire. Well, I'll definitely get my kill bonus for the day. Anyways, one of the things being is that, yeah, it's also disgusting as hell. And so this one's always left me a bit of a mystery. We can assume that developers are simply creating the larger complex because they have the room to do so. But if they're assuming there's any thought behind it, a place this large with only two people, something's a bit off. And yeah, what was this anyways? Ornamental. Ah. They're also thieves. <laughs> this is stolen from the Roman eye, and you definitely uh give it back to the individual. Now the fact that it's a wooden knight means it's probably a symbol of Oh, good grief. It's probably a symbol of Dracula, so it's gone belong to the Draculesti. But Yeah. The thing is they like to say this is an ancient place and they've been here for generations, excuse me. But it's built over a 1970s Soviet bunker, which means it cannot be more than at the time of 2014 when you're here, about 35 years old. So who made it? Why did they do so? I don't actually have a full theory in this. I mean, my guess is the Demirs may in fact be a front for a larger organization. But let's skip around to the next person who's inhabiting this particular section. Yeah, one thing I'll, that and here's the other thing to notice: Blaga's in two places. Now I've already mentioned this in the um, episode where I fought him, which is where this section is here. But we are not moving just through space and move through time. This is an earlier version of Blaga that is not lost his brothers and is depressive, and he's here to help challenge, looking for challengers to a fight for one of the trials, namely us. What means that essentially when we walk across a landscape, we appear and disappear to the linear bound, ta bound individuals. So we are literally like a ghost to them. We're like a supernatural being that appears at the moment of their greatest need and does things. Now, let's talk about the ghoul fens here. This section over here is another dump, but it is a Soviet dump. You're going to notice Soviet vehicles, Soviet garbage. You will get into it in a bit. But the thing that's important is what happened here. Now, these are Oriachi scanners. I mean, shield things, but they're not active. This is not an Oriachi facility. This basically means that the Oriachi were trying to set up a facility here to penetrate into there for some reason, and they failed, like they mostly do. In fact, this is them up here, I believe. Yeah, again, another one of the Oriachi hidden little bases, which have another compound. Excuse me. I didn't mean to bother you. Sorry about that. Uh, we'll do that later. Next to this uh, electrical thing, probably used it for their own facilities. But yeah, they set up another facility here, another one of the portable vans to collect more specimens. And they failed. They failed to establish a perimeter because a perimeter means all around, you dumbasses, not just next to the road. They did so against the ghouls and ignored the werewolves that they were hunting. That's kind of stupid. But the woman over here has nothing to do with that. We've taught, there's Elena Falea will be, if you're doing this in real time, I've already gone this mission as a bonus mission beforehand, but if you're doing this in sequence, you probably will be experiencing her explanation, her uh, mission after this one. Usually I like to put the playlist into um, narrative. Just drink. 
Yeah, she's here. She's uh, decided to stay here until she dies. But as you can see, there's this convoy right here that has completely obliterated the tunnel. In fact, I can't go past this point despite being able to see the fire over there. So the question is, who the hell are these guys? And they were the morning light. You can just answer that question right there. And the question is why there are. Well, that's pretty easy. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the Orochi decided to trash these guys before they were wiped out. The question is why? I mean, the Morning Light and the Orochi are both allies unknowingly and enemies knowingly. They come from the same set of resources because the Morning Light is, of course, being created by the um, a faction from Oriachi, which was... we'll get into narratively in a long way, but right now, like with the factionalization between Lilith and Samuel, it's another faction of Oriachi that's broken off for its own thing. Now, the Morning Light's a cult, of course, cults seem to be coming up a lot in my games. And this is one of the people who that they managed to recruit. Now, she was going to go into more of it than I would, but I'll talk about it later after she does. Okay, Alina, let's get your story. Tell me about it. All of my friends are dead. I don't mean they were killed. Maybe some of them were. It's a fucking ugly world. I mean, I never knew them when they were alive. I'm glad. All that stupid, unpredictable noise. All that sticky heat. Erased. Blue-gray skin, perfectly cold to touch. Beautiful. Okay, so she's necromantic as well. Not necessarily in the magical way, but... She's definitely a death fetishist. Which kind of... Like is its own actual psychological condition in which you find the... Uh, she says the perfection of the stillness of death more attractive than of life doesn't necessarily mean you have to go any further in that i mean you can just be super goth and have a lot of uh keep a gravestone in your uh in your bedroom but um i'm thinking she went a bit farther than that considering the people that she's with i should have stayed in medical school the social workers got that right white lights on bright steel the scent of antiseptics when i walked into the morgue i felt i had come home it's also a possibility that she is a necromancer potential. And then you know that she has the ability, the resonance with the death energy to raise the dead. Now, of course, in this game, there's no such thing as straight-up necromancy. Blosis is blood magic, and that's not the same thing. I mean, ironically, you don't have the raise dead as your uh, temporary ally scenario you do in a lot of other games. So, yeah, necromancy is iffy in this game. I mean, right now, even the vampires are not reanimate corpses there and they're they're um infected so are the zombies you fight in kingsmith they're infected by the filth there's no real necromancy which is an interesting concept but i went outside i fell in with the wrong crowd the ones who said alina was their kind of freak that we could make all the world a mortuary it takes just a little time a little money little favors don't trust the living. There's my advice. Basically, somebody manipulated her condition to get them to join the Morning Light as a willing convert. The documents we find about her regarding, um, oh god, what's his name? The abuser we find in the next section who's been running this section, running the sect of the Morning Light. Yeah, essentially, she was a low level disposable asset to them. Basically, they're the whole about trying to kill off the entire world and bring out the apocalypse. Yeah, she was probably all on board with that from the beginning. Now she's probably thinking that it was a bad idea. <laughs> no, she just said that actually. By the way, the social having a social worker tell you what to organize, what sort of um, jobs you have based on your psychological disorder, it's kind of hilarious. But I don't know if I trust her as a mortician. She might like the corpse a little too much. <laughs> I know nothing about this place. We had been on the road away from Bucharest for months, city to city, town to town, until the drink and drugs ran out, then drive, drive again. Mm -hmm. Morning light church meetings, staying in big houses, fancy hotels, I don't think we paid for any of them. It's a lot of money. There were noises in the night sometimes, screams. It was like falling through a dream. I saw wolves running in the streets, dead birds watching from the rafters. Well, not only the keeper on drugs, they're basically supernatural creatures where um, 
following and monitoring them. Now, if you remember back in the main game, at a certain point, uh, Lilith, or possibly Mara without Lilith's knowledge, ordered all of the humans to be slaughtered, with the exception of Alina um, and the two we find in the warded cabin down in the uh, Carpathian Fangs. Basically, they'd serve their purpose. You might as well just kill them all. Um, so, yeah, that's what cults do. Basically, they get everything out of you, and then they dispose of the remnants. Adrian says we have to go far, out to the Carpathians. There is a hunting lodge in the mountains where we can stay. Old friends. Hmm. Centuries old. The vampires. We knew he was lying. A shark has no friends. But it was too late. So we came here. Then the snow came. Then Adrian's friends did. They were hungry. Surprised she wasn't big into being a vampire herself. If it was like, I can't tell you because they'd kill me, I'd do it. I'm not afraid to die. I've fantasized about it since my 14th birthday. A million ways, and none of them like this. In Transylvania. I don't do vampires. Hmm. Very too animate. Morning light are worse than vampires. They don't just suck you dry and let you go. That's too easy. They change you. Empty out your mind and body. Fill what's left of you with nightmares. Strip you down until you're just a thing. And it's still not over. There's no release. Think about that. She's a, she has dreamed about dying since she was 14. She's obviously been severely abused. Basically, she's wanted to die, yet not wanted to be the one to kill herself. She doesn't seem... She, remember, she won't kill herself in our interactions. She won't even do so. She just wants to die by some means other than that. Not to be killed violently and not to uh, die of her own hand, so probably been looking for an OD or something like that since then, or some other faction way to do so, but yeah, the Morning Light took advantage of that, like, stringing her along, probably hoping f that they'd kill her in some nice way, but nope, they just keep her going like an animated corpse where they still can. Only the changing. It's best when the eyes are gone. You can't look into a, what do you say, tentacle and see what's trapped behind it. I'm not ending up like that. No way. I won't have the oblivion I dreamed of, but I'll take death cheap and dirty over the morning light. She's referring to the fact that probably a number of the morning light have been infected by the filth, which means they're becoming the dreamer's slaves. And if you remember, the filth ones are our opposites, you know, they don't die. They're currently stuck forever in gibbering madness, and that's just probably what she doesn't want. So remember, we're locked in time right here. So every time we come back to this point, we are just before she probably gets killed. I'm not entirely sure how she does it. She doesn't want to be torn apart by a ghoul, and they're sitting over there. She probably... Hmm... I probably just found a, uh, something to do it for her in a more quieter way. Now, for all we know, there might have been something up in the Oriachi uh, medical kit up there that she uses. But yeah, let's talk about the ghouls. Now, the ghouls over here, remember, are they're essentially being used as disposable, f disposable uh, fodder for the uh, the vampire crusade. And when they're like the werewolves, when they're not actively being used, they tend to create squat in dens, usually collecting human junk, which they seem to worship like a fetish. So these things are like garbage worshippers. Worshipping, ooh, a different type of filth. Oh, gods, how do I get up there? It that exudes muck. I love that line. I really do. But it's also not attacking me, which is a good thing. I only give myself one shot at trying to get that, and then I'll uh, give up. Let's see, what do we got? I think we go up here. Can we do that? Yeah, we can. Oh, guys, I'm busy. You know, that would have gone a lot better for you if you just let me be. Okay, so, all right. Let's see if we can get it from here. Hmm, something's growling at me. Ah, there we go. Sorry. 
That's uh, just ooh shiny distractions. Ooh, and we got more on ghouls. Of course we got more on ghouls. Anyways, never mind that distraction. My apologies. Let's see. So yeah, but the reason we want to be interested in these guys is where they all got the junk from. Now, they seem to be obsessed with the Soviet facility over here. It's a small facility, a tactical signal station belonging to, of course, the Red Hand. The guys who did everything here. Excuse me. Now, this is a standard Cold War Soviet construction. Basically, this is a World War II pillbox style, where you can just basically put a machine gun in every single one of these doors to hold off people coming. You notice, however, you can also shoot into the facility in case, you know, you're having little loyalty issues. Soviet Union had a lot of loyalty issues. But you got to give the Soviets something. They really know how to build stuff to last. And I do like, I mean, they even still have power going here. And you can use that satellite facility over there to communicate, which is kind of interesting. And by the way, that may be nukes over there. Short range nuclear uh, launcher, which is kind of weird until you realize that they're perfectly willing to nuke. Uh, they would have been perfectly willing during the Cold War if Romania had tried to break off nuking capitals from inside the own country because they're the ones that had all the military facilities in there. Excuse me. Okay, there you go. But yeah, you can use this facility its, and its equipment itself, so it's a lot some serious Ragnarok proofing over there. But yeah, so right, you're going to get the impression that basically the Red Hand had miles upon miles. They were basically ruling this spot here. Okay, let's... Speaking of which... I mean, even the tunnels are still got operational power. That's amazing. Until you realize where it's all coming from, that power station. Now, the Soviet power station down here has become infected with fungal monsters that are absorbing electricity, and I hate those things. I really do. But as you can see, the facility itself is still operational even after being set on fire and overrun. So that's the thing about the Soviet constructions of, the night, of that particular era, of the Cold War era. They were built to last. For example, you can tell the difference between the weapons, the AK-47 of the time and the M16-1A, or A1, sorry. Um, the weapons, the M16-A1 is a superior weapon in all performance stats. You basically, it's got longer range. It's got slightly, I mean, it's got longer range. It's got um, slighter, a lighter amount of weight, so you can carry it for a longer distance. It's got a uh, decent amount of uh, parts and tools and uh, clip ons to go on it. But the AK 47, you can run it over with a tank, drop it in water, and fill it and fill it full of mud to clean it out and fire the damn thing. It is designed to last. That is because in Soviet territories are a lot harsher than the United States. So therefore, any weapons or devices or equipment that they use is designed to be to survive. I mean, the power lines are still going. Oh, that's a beautiful moonrise over there. Um, the power lines are still running like of that. The systems are all running. The switches device are all activated because they're using cruder analog. I don't know if you've ever heard of Maxwell's theorem, but the theorem states that the more complicated the piece of equipment or the system that it's in, the sooner it breaks down. The Soviets made super simple, easy to understand equipment, and it broke down less. Now, it's actually when they started getting more complicated down to the late era of the 1980s and 90s that their equipment started having the same sort of issues that the United States did, and they had less resources to try to take care of it. There's also the fact that a lot of Soviet-style um, um, equipment and such is being done essentially by, sl by uh, slaves. Then during the communist system, well, fascist system, it just called itself communist, and they stopped producing it once, once it became abundantly clear. Because here's the thing about the Soviet Union. When it first came out in the 1950s and 60s, people were all big on it because they still remember the Romanovs, a group of um, corrupt nobles that essentially ran Russia into the ground. And they thought the revolution would produce something better. And as soon as Stalin took over and turned it over into a totalitarian republic, I mean, a totalitarian um, country, by ha making himself the sole ruler, all progress stopped. Basically, it became his private fiefdom. And people lost their faith. And they lost their faith, they lost their ingenuity, and they lost the desire to make a better world because they felt like they would not have any place in it. It would only exist for a tiny elite. And again, another Oriachi encampment. Oriachi doesn't know anything, about, anything that much about uh, ripe security now, do they? But in any case, 
I think this is where we're going to go in this section here. I'm looking at the timer, and I think I've got one other... Oh, God, I'm invisible at the moment. I forgot about that. They really do look like a ghost at the moment. Anyway, so I will uh, pop over to the next section one hit. Hang on. So I've actually not quite back where I wanted to be because doing a teleport jumping and such, but then I realized what it was kidding me at the Demir farm. Stare at me right in the face, the damn wolves. They're not tame, okay? As insane as this may sound, Mama Demir fucked a werewolf. We've been talking about that with uh, Blaga Brothers, but there's probably more degenerate versions of that scenario in which a werewolf-like being... We remember the werewolves that we know are either like the Blaga, completely human or completely feral by this point. There might have been one that was kind of in the middle. They have a kid. The kid is messed up. She has to put down the thing, but they may have, as a result from the boy, the control over the wolves, which explains why they can hunt so much because he's controlling all the wolves. It's also a possibility that there are other members of the family, in other words, that help provide them with the meat. We don't know exactly what her abilities are, but if you she can um, tame and break a werewolf to uh, to work to uh, provide her with a son, and then potentially take over the line as a result. It's kind of a messed up way of achieving power, but hey, power. That's what people want, especially in this game. But in any case, what I really wanted to show you is over here. Last statement. Now, I went over this when we went over the episode. This is the Hind D that crashed from the Red Hand during the Demonic Vation of Hell that was somehow stopped. Now, that's a story I haven't yet seen the end of. My guess is that whatever portal they used to Hell was a temporary one and collapsed under its own weight. But as you can see, there are two that. There's the succubus cut and stuck in the tree here back. That's over this direction, I believe, right here. Over here, the succubus stuck in the tree is imprisoned, and the hind D with the dead with the dead soldiers in it. Now that just tells a story in its own right. You see, whatever happened to the red hand's point of view, they did from a scientific point of view. So that spell holding the succubus in—that's not the red hand. The red hand unleashed demons, and the locals took care of it. The fae, the um, the uh, Draculesti, and other individuals. The fact that magic was used for it indicates that the Fae probably brought the ones who sealed her in there because they couldn't destroy her for whatever reason. Of course, remember that we are a combat version of Fae created by uh, Gaius who, to handle situations like that, but not everyone has that ability. So what we probably are looking at is... How do you say this? Um, let's see. How do you say this? This is probably the scenario. This, the Red Hand tampers with the portals. The portals then end up uh, leashing Hellspawn. The Soviets try to fight them and fail for the most part, And but they do weaken with the point where the Draculesti, the uh, allies from the village, remember the village of an operational at this point, and the local Fae all step together and put an end to it. What's interesting is it did not call in any bees that we know about because it's not the end of an age scenario, so we don't know if any of our predecessors came, but I'm guessing not, because the bees tend to be a last-ditch effort. Like I said, I believe we're temporary phenomena, and the stress of this is eventually going to burn us out, body and soul, that would make us part of the buzzing instead of being separate beings. And why do that when you can have, like with the um, Aioli here, a fate that lasts thousands of years willing to defend an area? So yeah, we're essentially sacrificing the short term for the long term, this result. And that will probably be where we want to, because I want to tackle the uh, I want to tackle the Romanesci, the Draculesti Romani camp in the next episode, because once we start talking about the Romani, we open a lot, we open a can of worms, we open a lot of can of worms, because there is, shall we say, some issues with using them in myth, as they are actually a min persecuted minority in Eastern Europe. In fact, they're not doing so well in Romania and Poland right now. Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> lies of the right wing brought some old patterns back to play ones that have been going on for thousands of years but we'll cover that in the next episode so far i thought hope you enjoyed this section of dealing with the edges of the shadowy woods this is fantastic world saying farewell from lovecraft country and secret world interludes hope you enjoyed this if you really enjoyed it down below there are um you can like share subscribe and there are links to the gumroad payment platform one dollar will give you additional bonus material and two dollars will give you early access to videos and, of course, we have the regular Secret World uh, running. And at the current time of this, we're still doing Cultist Simulator as the uh, other series for Lovecraft Country. If you like an idea of a Lovecraftian tactical game in which you are trying to create a cult and ascend to becoming an inhuman god, by all means, check that one out. Anyway, so I will see you next time. And, of course, we're still doing our season of Halloween.